Hello, everyone. I uh, am getting the message from YouTube Live that we are indeed live. As you know, at the beginning of these things, it's always great uh, to hear from you. I have heard already from Amber in Daytona, from Mary in Garden Grove, close to my where I grew up. Hi, Mary, uh, and not far from Disneyland. And from Dallas, who is in Windsor, Ontario, Canada. Anybody else out there? And please give me those little thumbs ups to make sure that uh, that our tech is working, that you can see me uh, and that you can hear me. I did see one thumbs up, but it came in in an unusual place. So um, anyway, yeah, sh chime in in the chat box that uh, that we are indeed live, that you can see me, you can hear me, and we've gotten past all of the, uh, the tech issues. And then we will get in deep into our subject for today. For today. So let me give you a minute or two for people to sort of stream into our uh, to our live stream here. Um, I will wait for a few more thumbs up um, and uh, positive feedback from people who can see me and hear me. And once I see that, uh, we will get right into the subject at hand, uh, which, is, which is weight loss, a very popular subject indeed. Uh, and one, oh, I see that Mary is telling me that she can't find emojis. <laughs> But that's okay if you can't find emojis. As long as you can see and hear me, that's what I care about even more. Um, I, uh, I see the, the thumbs ups are coming in, so that's really great. As I look over um, to the live stream and I can see the mirror image of myself, I, um, I just realized I've been doing these for several weeks now, and I know some of you have joined me uh, on other discussions about... Um, about uh, immunity, about other subjects. And as I, as I look right now at myself, I notice something. I don't know if any of you have noticed it, but I got a haircut yesterday uh, and I uh, trimmed my beard up a little bit. And I think I just figured out what the what the secret is to, to weight loss. You know, we talked about this talk today as a uh, as an opportunity to discuss the weight loss secret. And I, in looking at my own image here, I think I figured it out. Just get a haircut, trim your beard a little bit. And then of course I'm wearing these, uh, these vertical stripes, which have a slimming effect, I'm told. I, I know very little about fashion, but I think vertical stripes are good. So there you have it. There's the there's the secret to weight loss, uh, a haircut, uh, a little uh, personal hygiene and some vertical stripes, right? Um, so let's get into it more seriously. Um, in thinking about those vertical stripes, a, a thought just, uh, just occurred to me and something that, that comes up very often, actually, a really, really interesting story um, about uh, that, that relates actually to horizontal stripes rather than the vertical ones that I'm wearing. Is anybody out there remember or familiar with a character, a movie character? Here's a, our little quiz to start our, our day off here. Um, who, his name is Augustus Gloop. Okay, Augustus Gloop. Uh, chime in in the chat box if you know who Augustus Gloop is, what movie he comes from. Uh, it, it, it's a very popular character. There's actually been two very popular movies, years apart, and I'll get to that in a second. What movie is Augustus Gloop from? And uh, once I see some of your answers, I'll, I'll tell you why I care about Augustus Gloop. And now I just decided to, uh, to start off our conversation with this particular movie character. Anybody know? Mary's not sure, but she thinks I got a good haircut. Thank you, Mary. All right. Uh, as the uh, the answers start to roll in about who Augustus Gloop is, I'm gonna I'm gonna. Um, there it is, Susan Patterson. And uh, uh, yep, knew the answer. Hi, Susan. Um, Augustus Gloop is from Willy Wonka and the Chocolate Factory. There's been there's been two movies uh, that have been about Willy Wonka. That's a sort of a famous Broadway play and it's been made into movies. And the characters that, so Augustus Gloop is one of the children uh, that, that kind of parade their way through Willy Wonka's Chocolate Factory. Um, and uh, for lack of a better term, he's the heavy one, right? He is the glutton. He's the one that falls into the chocolate river and drowns in the chocolate river. Um, so he's the big boy, right? Um, Augustus Gloop. And so there's been two Hollywood adaptations of this famous play. Uh, the first one, I think, I, I don't know my dates exactly, but it was in the 1970s, in the mid to late 1970s, I believe. And then the more recent one was, was in the 2000s. I think Johnny Depp played Willy Wonka in that one. And that was in uh, probably somewhere around 2005, between 2005 and 10. And it's worth doing, and maybe I can put a link to these images in the, in the notes for you here today, looking at the characters, the actors who played Augustus Gloop in both of those movies. If you look at the one from the 1970s, this is a kid that would not even be considered obese or even fat for that matter uh, in, in today's standards. This kid was a little bit chunky, you know, back in the 70s, we called a kid like that kind of chunky, kind of thick. Um, 
But that kid would have never been cast as Augustus Gloop in the in the 2000s version, the Johnny Depp version of the movie. And 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 the reason why this is so interesting is that uh, things have changed a lot in the last 30, 40 years. You know, the definition, um, you know, the societal sort of prevalence of obesity, especially among children, has gone up massively. And so a kid that played a movie character who was supposed to be a fat kid in the movie in 1970s would never get a job as a fat kid in the movies today. The kid who played Augustus Gloop in the more modern version is much more round. He wears big horizontal stripes, unlike the vertical ones that I'm wearing here today, uh, and is, is more morbidly obese compared to the to the kid from the 1970s. That is a big societal problem that we have and a really interesting sort of Hollywood adaptation um, of that problem. So something to think about. I mean, we are we have really, really gone astray uh, when it comes to obesity in this country. You all know that, but Augustus Gloop, just take a look at those characters and you will be you will be shocked at the difference between the 1970s version and the uh, and the 2000s version. It's really, really instructive. So that's how we started off our conversation today. Uh, it looks like things are working in terms of our tech. Uh, we got lots of thumbs up and people who knew uh, which movie Augustus Gloop was from. So let's uh, uh, let's get into it. A lot of you who are in here today um, saw the uh, the email promotion that came out that had uh, that had a few different elements that we were going to talk about, a few different points to cover in our conversation today, along with uh, a Q and A section that I will leave open for you towards the end of our conversation. So let me give you my presentation bullet points here to start off with. I'll um, stick to those, and then we'll open it up for Q and A uh, towards the end of our hour. So in the uh, promotional material that you saw for today's live stream, there was there was four bullet points. I'll go over them briefly now and then and then we'll weave them into our conversation. The first one was the number one way to jumpstart a weight loss journey. The second is the fastest and safest way to lose those first five pounds, which are those most stubborn pounds. Uh, the last five can be stubborn as well. Um, a most common problem that prevents people from losing weight in the first place. And then which foods are keeping you fat and which foods accelerate the burn of fat. So let's let's go over those. I'm going to illustrate each one of these points uh, with stories. I think stories connect in the same way that we can all relate to that Augustus Gloop phenomenon. I have some other stories from my own personal experience in my clinical practice to share with you that illustrate each one of these points, and then we'll dial in to the details. So the first bullet point was, was about the number one way to jumpstart any weight loss journey, right? Um, so in my view, the answer to that, the number one way is to learn something new. That is what we are here to do today. It's to have an aha moment, an Archimedes Eureka type of moment where you learn something, something becomes intrinsic, it becomes part of who you are. There's a really good reason if you go to your local library, which you probably haven't done lately, um, because there are many of them are closed or limited hours and whatnot, or bookstores, or certainly the internet, you will see an endless array. I mean, the shelves are bowing underneath the the weight of books about diet, about weight loss. You know, there's a real good reason why there are so many books, so many programs, so many blogs on this particular subject, and the main reason is that most of them do not work, right? And the main reason why most of them do not work is because the information presented in that material usually is sort of for short-term gains only, right? These fad diet type of programs, but largely, and maybe even more important than that, those programs don't, they don't punch people in the gut. And I don't mean a literal punch in the gut, but they don't give people the insight or the awakening. They don't give them news they can use, information they can really pun intended, sink their teeth into, make it become a part of the fabric of who they are, and then take action on that, right? When people are inspired, they become motivated. When they learn something new and have that eureka moment, it becomes part of who they are. So learning something new, which is what we're here to do today, uh, is the number one way to jumpstart a, a healthy, sustainable weight loss journey. And I hope that you're going to learn more than one thing new today. Of course, there's a lot of uniqueness and variability. We're all different. But I want at the end of this hour, something, at least one thing to have kind of blown your mind, opened up your mind, become part of who you are. And then you can take that little nugget and make it become part of what you do, taking what you know and turning it into what you do. That's the number one way to jumpstart this journey. 
Um, the second one, uh, the second bullet point was the fastest and safest way to lose those first five pounds. I'm going to, I'm going to take this one a little different take on this one. I'm going to, I'm going to flip it around a little bit and tell you one way to not lose those first five pounds or even those first 50 pounds for that matter. And this is a true story from my office. I'm going to change the names associated with this, but the numbers are real. Let's, uh, let's call this man, Joe, Joe comes into my, into my office, a real patient. And um, he's a big boy, right? This guy is close to 300 pounds. Um, you know, it's the, the, the sort of patient where I have uh, extra sort of sturdy chairs to accommodate to make sure that he doesn't uh, go tumbling down in the office. This is a big man. Um, and he came in with a really interesting kind of unusual request. He wanted uh, doctor's orders um, for a novel compounded prescription, right? Available from a unique pharmacy. He, he couldn't buy it himself over the counter, although it was technically an over the counter product. I'm not going to get into the details. And um, he wanted me to approve it, right? He wanted a doctor's note, a prescription, if you will, for him to get this, this novel, unique hormonal treatment for, for weight loss. Like I said, he was about 300 pounds. And um, I was really skeptical. I, I was uncomfortable with that. I didn't really, you know, I, I didn't really approve. Um, and he pushed back. He pushed back against me. And the way he pushed back, this is the story that he told me. He told me that he had lost 150 pounds. Um, he just matter of factly like that. So like I said, this guy was about 300 pounds when he came in to see me and he told me that he had lost 150 pounds. I kid you not on this. And I'm thinking, my goodness, you know, if he lost 150 pounds, that puts him probably somewhere closer to 450 pounds prior. Right. So I asked him to explain and elaborate a little bit. And it turns out that this particular hormonal agent that other doctors had prescribed for him before had helped him to lose those 150 pounds. I pressed a little bit further and I found out that what he really meant, which was ridiculous, was that he had lost 50 pounds three times. Okay. He lost 50 pounds three different times. So he started off at something like 200 pounds, lost 50, gained back 75, did the treatment again, lost 50, gained back 75, you know, and this is the cycle. So I, I, I told him that that's just not fair. I mean, that's really ridiculous. You can't tell me that you lost 150 pounds. And right now at this moment, while we're talking, you're the heaviest weight that you've ever been. Right. Um, so that was sort of a, a, you know, almost a joke, although he didn't, he didn't frame it that way. Um, why am I illustrating this point on the safest way to lose those first five pounds? The reason why, of course, is that this story is a perfect example. This gentleman, Joe, he told me that that diet plan worked. He told me that it worked for him three different times. And I assured him that no, it did not work. That treatment plan had failed him in, in his long-term trajectory, right? In his long-term battle against obesity, in his long-term battle against heart disease and diabetes and everything that goes with it. That treatment did not work if he's now heavier than he ever was. So the answer, the solution, the idea about the fastest and safest way to lose those first five pounds is in any way, and we're gonna talk about many of the ways to do that, that is sustainable, right? Those first five pounds are really, really critical, yes, because they demonstrate that sort of success that you can have. But more importantly than those five pounds themselves is that we are on a long-term and sustainable trajectory, not this up and down, up and down, like, like, like Joe did. That's the story of the, uh, the most ridiculous 150 pound weight loss that I, that I've ever heard. Um, this story is one like the, uh, the old biblical, uh, reference about chopping wood and carry water, chop wood, carry water. We don't want the up and down like this. We want long-term sustainable change. So that's a, my a short, brief answer to number two, and we'll get into the details here shortly. Um, the number three was about the most common problem that keeps people from, from losing weight in the first place. And I think that th there's several answers to this. The, 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 the primary one, the big umbrella answer to the most common problem is that most people are just focusing on the wrong thing. They're focusing on the wrong thing in terms of exercise. They're focusing on the wrong thing in terms of food. So that, and we're going to explore in detail what I mean by those things as we moved on down through the, the bullet points. Oh, and by the way, all of you uh, will get these bullet points. I'm, um, I'm telling some stories now. I didn't jot those down for you, but I jotted down uh, at least 20 different 
hot tips uh, that are going to be delivered to you after this live stream in the form of some beautifully prepared notes that my team have for you. So, um, so you don't need to write any of this stuff down. If you want to write down the Augustus Gloop story, go ahead, but you'll get the notes uh, from this talk so that you can have them yourself and refer back to them on your own journey. Um, so like I said, the, the thing that most people are struggling with in terms of this most common problem is, is the focus on the wrong thing. You know, here we are in the beginning of the year, it's still only February. A lot of people have already at this point um, begun to lose money on the gym memberships that they bought in January. This year, of course, was a weird year because of uh, because of the pandemic. But you know the routine: gym memberships sell uh, discounted rates and promo packages in January. People use them in January, and then by mid February, uh, the gyms are just making money hand over fist because nobody is going to the gym anymore. That is an example of focusing on the wrong thing. Um, most people have the intention of going to a gym and usually jumping on a treadmill or doing some kind of spin class or orange theory or whatever the case may be. Don't get me wrong. I think exercise is really, really important. And we'll talk about that shortly. But the idea that you're going to jump on a treadmill and lose weight is an example of focusing on the wrong thing. This notion of ex extended cardiovascular training is um, has been disproven time and time again. Exercise does not help people lose weight. It's really, really a provocative thing to say. What happens when you exercise is that you burn calories, yes, and then that ca caloric burn, uh, which is usually fairly modest, if especially if you do cardio cardiovascular exercise, you know, you go on a treadmill for a half hour, you might burn 200 calories, which you can easily eat that 200 calories in a handful of, uh, you know, of snack foods after the gym, which so many people do. So there are methods by which to sort of leverage the power of exercise, the right kinds of exercise, um, but running endless hours on a treadmill is not it. That tends to kick up your hunger and not burn as many calories as most people believe. Uh, and that's an example of focusing on the wrong thing. We'll talk about the right things to focus on as we get down into, uh, into the substance of our notes here. So and then the fourth bullet point uh, in the intro that you saw, those that, that's a question about which foods are the ones that are keeping you fat and which foods are the ones that accelerate the fat burn. Um, the bullet points down below that we're going to discuss here shortly are going to explain a really interesting phenomenon that's called the Nova food classification system. So that's my first point, my first answer to the which foods are keeping you fat and which foods accelerate burn. I'll give you more detail here just shortly. Um, but before I do, two more stories for you. People love stories. I love stories, telling them, hearing them. And these are stories that are around that common theme of which foods are keeping people fat and which foods help to accelerate the burn. The first story comes from a patient, another real story from a real patient um, who had been a longtime uh, customer of the Weight Watchers organization. Weight Watchers, as many of you know, is uh, you know, used to before COVID have um, have group meetings where people could get together and discuss different issues. Um, weigh in and you know they also have all sorts of different food plans and point programs and whatnot. So this particular day, my my patient was at a Weight Watchers meeting. It was a well attended one, and you can imagine the scene in a Weight Watchers meeting is a bunch of people that are all overweight. They're all struggling and they're all trying to learn together. I, I appreciate the work that the organization does. This particular day, they were talking about something that's really important actually, and it's called the glycemic index. Have you all heard about the glycemic index? You can give me the uh, the thumbs up on glycemic index. If you know what it is, feel free to, uh, to type in any questions about it. I'm going to take your questions at the end. So the glycemic index, that was the, the subject of the conversation at this particular well-attended Weight Watchers meeting that my patient was at. And they were talking about the glycemic index and, and, and mentioning things like Carrots, for example, which have, believe it or not, a relatively high glycemic index. Carrots have a lot of naturally occurring sugars, carbohydrate compounds in them. So cooked carrots, even more than raw carrots, will, will raise your blood sugar, actually, more than most people realize. Similar, uh, similar truth about bananas. And if you take a banana compared to the, the same amount of, uh, of, of volume of berries, for example, banana has a much, much higher glycemic index. That means it raises the blood sugar higher. 
So this was the nature of the conversation at this Weight Watchers meeting. They're talking about bananas, and they were talking about apples and carrots and berries, and which of these foods, these whole foods, had the higher glycemic index. And a lot of people were commenting like, wow, you got to be really careful. You know, If you eat too many bananas or even too many carrots can raise up that blood sugar, make you store fat, et cetera, et cetera. And this is going on and on and on. Really interesting kind of scientific conversation about the glycemic index, at which point, Somebody stands up at the back of the meeting and raises their hand and says, hey, uh, I have a question. And, and the, the question comment is, is this. Here we are. We're in a Weight Watchers meeting. All of us have a very similar problem. And it's really interesting, this whole conversation about the glycemic index. But I want to ask a question to the group, all these overweight and obese people in the room. And the question is this. Are any of us here, actually here, because we ate too many bananas or too many carrots, right? And, you know, this kind of like whispers, like kind of giggles uh, percolate throughout the crowd. Um, this is another example of focusing on the wrong thing. This is an example of the foods, and you know the answer to this, that are keeping you fat versus the ones that accelerate fat burn. It's really a ridiculous notion. The vast majority of people who are in Weight Watchers meetings are not in Weight Watchers meetings because they ate too many carrots, right? And the, and the sugar load that's inside of those carrots. That's nearly impossible to become overweight or obese on fruits and vegetables alone. And so this is a really beautiful, funny, kind of charming story to illustrate that point. Let's focus on what really matters. And what really matters is these ultra processed foods that I'm going to talk about in our conversation about the Nova foods here shortly. Um, now, before we leave point number four, I have another story. I just had to find a place to fit this story in for you. And this is also about focusing on the right thing. And, and also really for me, kind of a, 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 an eye-opening conversation with another one of my patients, a morbidly obese individual. This is a person with extremely high BMI. He was well over 400 pounds when he came in to consult with me. Um, and this guy was, was a pastor. At a, at a local church, kind of a, a fire and brimstone preacher, a lovely, lovely guy. Um, and he was huge. He was, he was diabetic. He was grossly obese. Uh, and so I asked him, like, like you would expect a natural medicine or any doctor uh, to ask him about his food. I asked him what he eats on a typical day. Just give me a kind of a basic idea. And I'll, I'll give you a short story of his answers, which to this day just tickle me. Uh, what do you eat for breakfast? I asked him. And his answer was that he eats oatmeal for breakfast. I thought, wow, that's a, uh that, that's great, you know, because I eat oatmeal for breakfast a lot of times too. Uh, so that's that's pretty good, you know, check, check box. Uh, what do you eat for lunch? What's typical lunch? And he told me that his lunch is usually a salad. I said, wow, that's that's also pretty good because that's not unusual for me. I mean, maybe not every day, but oatmeal and salad, we're doing pretty good so far. Here you are, 400 pounds, you know, I want to hear what dinner is going to be, right? So I say, all right, now I'm ready. You know, what's what's uh, what's dinner? What do you usually eat for dinner? His answer, usually more oatmeal or another salad, right? And I think he's a reverend. <laughs> reverend, you know, I don't know about this. You know, something's just not adding up here. You know, you're you're sitting here 400 pounds and you're telling me that all you ever eat is oatmeal and salad. And you know, he he's 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 actually pretty honest. He's he says, you know, it's actually true that that is a lot of days what I what I eat. So then I then I pick a little bit further and I ask him, what is oatmeal? What does that what does that even mean? You know, what what is your oatmeal? Maybe let's like let's take a look at your oatmeal compared to my oatmeal, see if we can maybe find find some clues here. Well, it turns out that his oatmeal, he, he was very honest about this. He uses uh, instant sort of pre-sweetened oatmeal, like, uh, you know, cinnamon raisin type of oatmeals from the little packages. So he'll take three of those packages, not one, three of those packages, pour them in. These things are already heavily sugared, right? So there's already a whole bunch of added sugar in each one of those packages. He makes the oatmeal with, uh, with, with half and half and then pours in condensed milk, a half a can, you know, those little condensed milk cans, um, a half a can of condensed milk on top of the already sweetened oatmeal. I did the, I did the calculation right there in front of him for how many calories and how many grams of sugar uh, were in this man's morning oatmeal. And it was st absolutely stunning, right? It was staggering. He was eating more calories in a bowl of morning oatmeal than I would eat in an, at least an entire day, if not a day and a half. And so there's, there's your problem, you know, oatmeal. And Oh, it turns out of course his, his lunchtime salad, 
you know, there's two eggs chopped into it. There's bacon. There's little chunks of ham in there. It's drowned in uh, in ranch dressing. Again, we're probably talking about a salad that's upwards of 1,500 or even 2,000 calories, right? So he's putting down 5,000, 6,000, even more calories on a daily basis. And he tells me that it's oatmeal and salad. So we had to have a conversation about kind of changing uh, the recipe, so to speak, for the for the oatmeal and the salad, which in, in, in other words, are perfectly good food. So um, that's another example there of, of eating the wrong foods, not focusing on the right thing, and also just not really understanding, you know, in his mind, I think at the beginning there, oatmeal and salad were good foods. Those are healthy foods. He sweetened them up and made them taste the way he liked but he needed a little bit of education to help him understand what the implications of that decision were. So, so that's, uh, that's how we're going to address those bullet points as we, as we move along here. And then I'm going to kind of go rapid fire uh, so we can get to, uh, to your questions um, about, uh, about weight loss, natural medicine, herbal medicine, supplementation, et cetera, as we move along. Um, as we go into the bullet points, the same bullet points that you will have in the notes that, uh, that get delivered to you, um, I want to make a point. And the point here is that humans are unbelievably efficient machines. We, our physiology, and you've heard me talk about how in awe I am of human physiology so often. Um, it's, it's a beautiful orchestra of complex biology, physiology coming together. And it is, it's, it's really miraculous if you think about it that way. And one of the things that's so miraculous about our physiology is how extremely efficient we are. Let me give you an example. And the, the example is an automotive example. My first car when I was, when I was 16 years old was a 1970 Chevy Camaro. It was bright red. I got myself in trouble with that thing a few times. And it was a prototypical prototypical gas guzzler, right? It was not efficient at all. It was like a muscle car. It just slurped up gas. My current car that I use, I, we have three kids here, is a minivan, you know, uh, and the minivan is very efficient, right? It's a very efficient ca car. Now, think about this for a moment. If there's me, my 16-year-old self, and my current self sitting in those two cars, sitting at a stoplight, doing no work whatsoever, just sitting there, the Camaro is guzzling gas. It is very inefficient. The minivan, you know, the kind of classic import uh, automobile is using much less gas, doing the same amount of work, you know, whether they're driving or whether they're sitting. Human bodies, to use the automotive metaphor, are extremely efficient, right? We are extremely efficient machines. We can use very little fuel and go very long distances. That's how our physiology works. It's a beautiful thing. But it's a bit of a problem also, right? We are so efficient. What we want to be is we want to be that big V8 engine. We want to be guzzling the gas. We want to be burning through those calories. And so that's kind of part of our lesson here today is to understand our efficiency and understand how to make, how to make use of it most effectively, right? And that is where the beauty and the awe and the learnings of human physiology come in. So my, my point number one, and you'll see this in the notes that get delivered to you, is, is, is really a question. And it's a question I'm going to answer for you. But the question is, where did it go, right? We're all here going to lose five pounds this week, and we're going to do it by following this set of guidelines. When we lose those five pounds, where'd they go? Where are they? right? Like it was mass. It was actual physical weight, fat mass on your body somewhere, whether it's one pound or 100 pounds. When a human being loses weight, my question for you is, where is it? It used to be on you. And now where, where did it go? Um, I'm going to give you a couple answers. The answers that usually most people give when they, when they hear this question, number one, it is not flushed down the toilet, not number one and not number two. The fat is not flushed. Some amount of weight comes out in bowel movements and urine every day, yes, but that extra fat mass is not flushed down the toilet. The other answer that a lot of people give, thinking they understand the chemistry of this a little bit, is um, it is not burned off as heat. A lot of people think of calories. Calories are a measurement of heat. Um, the excess fat is not burned off as heat, and it's actually physiologically impossible. You can't take mass weight and turn it into energy like like heat that that's not how physics works so the 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 extra weight that five pounds you're going to lose this week did not go away in the form of heat where did it go it got turned into carbon dioxide and breathed out of your lungs that's where the fat goes the fat gets 
transitioned through this amazingly awesome biochemically complex process where it's metabolized, transitioned into carbon molecules, complexed to oxygen, and breathed out. That is where the fat goes. You breathe it off into thin air. Um, and that is an example of the unbelievable efficiency of human physiology. You breathe out that extra fat mass. It really is mind-blowing. Casey, the emoji with the mind-blowing, and it's absolutely true. Um, it's mind-blowing to me every time I even think about it. So I want you to have your mind blown. I want you to appreciate the beauties and the efficiencies of your own human physiology. Your body can do that. It is a remarkable, miraculous, extremely efficient machine. And so let's put these, these top tips to work for us here. Top tip number one, and this is particularly around food. I want to educate you about a food classification system that's called NOVA. We've talked a lot in the past, and I know you know about proteins and fats and carbohydrates, and a lot of nutritionists have categorized foods in different categories. You should eat this and not eat that, and there's all kinds of diet plans that center on eat more meat, eat less meat, eat you know this kind of thing, um, uh, paleo, keto, Atkins, vegetarian, vegan, on and on and on like that. And everyone says that they have the solution. And it turns out that in, in a lot of ways, they're all wrong. And the reason why they're wrong is because that way of categorizing foods is really unnatural and really inappropriate. The, the reality that we need to be focusing on if we're focusing on, if we're, if our stated goal is weight loss, or if our stated goal is long-term health is food processing, right? The Nova system that I'm talking about takes foods and categorizes them into four categories. There's a link to those categories and an extensive conversation in the notes that you'll get. And those four categories are minimally processed, meaning came straight out of the earth, just in the form that they, that they were in. So in that category, you would have an egg. You would also have an eggplant, right? Because an eggplant came from the garden or the farm and the egg came out of a chicken and they're just what they are, minimally processed, right? Um, there's no other food classification system that puts an egg and an eggplant in the same category, by the way. Those are minimally processed foods. And then up the chain from there, you have four categorizations, group one, two, three, and four. And group four is where your Snickers bars and your Twinkies and your Pop-Tarts and all your highly processed or in their terms, ultra processed foods reside. So the solution here in terms of what you ought to be eating for weight control uh, and also for your long-term health is foods that are almost exclusively from Nova category one, minimally processed foods, right? Now, I didn't make any distinction between meat, between eggs, animal products, vegetable products. M meats and uh, animal products can fit into Nova category one, as can uh, vegetables and fruits and things from plants. What we want to focus on is minimally processed. And that is your ticket to success. Now, brief side note on the meat and animal protein. We've talked about this before in previous discussions. It's extremely important that the health of the animal, if you choose to eat animals, is, is healthy and optimized, right? We want animals that lived good lives in pastures on grasslands, had good lives as animals, um, and, uh, and were humanely treated, fed appropriately, not caged in tiny cages, um, because conventional farming, livestock, agriculture uh, is is, is terrible, terrible for the animals, terrible for the planet, and terrible for you. So that's my caveat on meats uh, and animal products in general. Keep them from healthy, happy animals and stay in the Nova category one. You'll see a broad definition of what Nova category one is. And then little contributions from category two, a little bit of oil to help you saute those onions, a little bit of honey, uh, which is a minimally processed kind of, kind of sweetener that you can add. And if you stay in that zone of minimally processed food, the perimeter of the grocery store, if you will. Uh, that's your secret to success, okay? Um, number, num the, the next bullet point, um, and this is a really, really important one, probably as high on my list as it could possibly be, and it is to not drink your calories. Just don't drink your calories anymore. Don't drink sugar and don't drink extra calories. It's so unnecessary. Your options in you know, for, for liquids and hydration should come from... Uh, water, herbal tea, seltzer water if you must. Um, actually, I have, a, I have a can of it right here. I, I'm, a, I'm a big fan of uh, the, the seltzer water, just water with a splash or a little sprinkle of, um, of fruit extract in there. So a little squeeze of lemon or a little squeeze of raspberry puree. The company Spindrift makes some really nice seltzers that are just 
just a hint of fruit, minimal calories, no added sugars. Please do not drink your sugar and do not drink your calories. This applies to coffee drinks that are so full of fat, so full of sugar. The, the you know around here in New England, it's Dunkin' Donuts and Starbucks and all these kinds of things where you have frappuccinos and other types of chinos that are just loaded with calories and sugar. Do not drink your calories. And for many people who do drink their calories, that simple change is the ticket uh, to to significant weight loss. So don't drink your calories. Um, the next point, and, and this is a really interesting one. Um, I, I told you before about the automotive metaphor, the Camaro versus the, the minivan. Um, let's take a, a look at the dashboard of our cars for a second and say that, and talk about the fuel gauge, right? When you, when you go get gas at the, at the, at, at the gas station in your car, the fuel gauge goes from empty to full, right? Well, we humans, we have a fuel gauge of our own and that fuel gauge is called satiety, right? It's our feeling of fullness. And it's so funny, right? The, everyone's experienced this. The human fuel gauge is kind of broken. Well, it's not really broken. It's just that it's delayed, right? You need to get a few miles down the road in your human body in order for your fuel gauge to register that you're actually full. We have understood this, you know, medical people have understood this since ancient times, right? Ancient medical writers, Galen, Maimonides, Hippocrates understood the importance of stopping eating prior to feeling full. And the reason for that is that that fuel gauge just takes a minute to catch up. So when you understand that your fuel gauge, there's a lag there, unlike the one in your car, here's the lesson that comes from that. Put yourself out a, you know, a serving of food, hopefully a minimally processed, wholesome, nutrient dense, you know, balanced kind of meal on your plate, look at it, recognize right up front that this meal that I'm about to eat is going to sustain me until the next meal. And then don't get seconds, right? Your seconds today are lunch for tomorrow. Get yourself a set of snap lock glass containers. And instead of taking seconds for tonight's dinner, pack that up into a nice little lunch pack. And that's your lunch for tomorrow, which is now a minimally processed whole foods type of meal. Be advised your fuel gauge will catch up after that meal. Even though you want to go back for seconds, give it 10 minutes, 20 minutes, drink a glass of water. The fuel gauge will reach the top and you'll realize that you weren't still hungry for more. So that's a really, really important lesson. And we're going to kind of get into some nuance on that here in just a minute before we get to questions. Um, uh, the next bullet point is, is, is about exercise and what so many people get wrong. I'm going to give you just one simple word. You can write it down. I want you to practice it. It matters that you do it, not write it. And that word is squat to squat, right? The squat is a fundamental human movement. It's really interesting. If any of you have kids or see kids, have experience with kids, you know that little toddlers, they like squat down, both feet flat on the floor, butt to the ground. A lot of physiology types call it ass to the grass. I hope I'm allowed to say that on YouTube. Squatted down all the way, knees deeply bent, squatting down. This is also the position that a lot of people from many, many other countries uh, use um, for defecation, right? Rather than sitting on a toilet, that sort of squatted position. That squatted position and then rising from that squat is extremely foundational human movement. Most people in America and the westernized world lose their ability to do a deep squat and rise from it by the time they are teenagers. And that is really, really sad. Why is that, am I talking about squats now? Because if you squat, squat all the way down as far as you can, as far as your knees and hips will allow, feet shoulder width apart and squat down and then stand back up and do that again. You can put a chair underneath you just in case you're worried about falling and just sit down on the chair and pop back up. What you're working is big muscles, the quads in the front of your thighs, the hamstrings in the back of your thighs and your glutes. You know what those are. Those are the biggest muscles that you've got. Those muscles are your calorie burning engines. If you can understand back to our, our uh, efficiency model, the Camaro versus the minivan, using those muscles and building and strengthening those muscles is going to increase the size of your engine. It's going to increase the burn rate of the calories that you eat while you're doing the exercise, for hours after you do the exercise, and then as a consequence of building strength and bigger muscles, you now have a bigger engine that can burn more calories at 
rest. So the, the squat, the deep squat that works out the quads, the hamstrings, and the glutes is a foundational exercise that you should do every day. That's much, much more important for weight loss than running on treadmill for hours at a time. Build strength in your biggest muscles. Compare the size of your thigh muscles to even the size of your, of your arm muscles. They're nothing. So doing this kind of thing, biceps, yeah, it may, might make your arms look good and you know fill out the, uh, the, 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 the tank top, but it does very, very little comparatively to the much larger muscles in the lower extremity, the glutes, the hamstrings, and the, and, and the quads. So, so squat, um, that's a very important one. Um, and then before I get to our, our kind of Q&A section, um, another sort of really, I, I think, kind of an aha moment for all of us here is, is, is about hunger. Um, so many of us set out on a, a plan of some sort of weight management or dietary modification strategy, and then we fall flat on our faces because of hunger, right? Um we feel hungry and hungry makes us crazy, right? We get really bent out of shape and we feel hungry. This term that a lot of people are using now is called hangry. And it's like a combination of hungry and angry. And I can, I can relate. I think all of us can relate. What I want to do now is help you understand and hopefully just really help you kind of like get real, get a strong sense of this, that, that you, you need to improve your relationship with hunger and the way to do that is to understand what hunger is really all about. Here's how that story goes. It's really important to remember that our ancestors, all of our ancestors, they had one biggest problem throughout their lives. And I'm talking about hundreds and hundreds of years ago, going back thousands. And that biggest problem that they ever had was not enough food. That was the big problem for human societies for millennia. They did not have enough to eat right? We should all be amazingly grateful. I know I am. I hope you are too. That most of us, of course, not all of us in the world, but most of us do not have that problem anymore. We do not have the problem of hunger. We do not have the problem of worrying about whether or not we are going to eat today or tomorrow. Now, granted, some people still do, and that's a tragedy of humanity, but most of us here watching YouTube right now don't have that issue. We have solved the hunger problem in the industrialized world. And that's remarkable. That's been the biggest problem that humans have had forever, right? Why does this matter? Well, right now, compared to thousands of years ago, calories are everywhere. We can eat whenever we want, however much we want. We can eat more calories if we want to do in a single day than one of our, our primordial ancestors could have eaten in a year, maybe even in a lifetime. And the reason why that matters is because this cue, this red flag, this biological, like very deeply emotional marker called hunger is a very strong force. For our ancestors, it mattered a lot because if you felt hungry, that meant you got to go get food. You have got to go do food seeking behavior, find something, anything, because if that hunger persists, you're going to waste away and die, right? So hunger is a deeply primitive, very powerful emotional cue because it prevents death when there is no food. But here we are in the modern world and we have plenty of food, more food than we could ever consume, more calories than those ancestors could ever get. And yet there's this carryover. There's this residual emotional red flag. And that emotional red flag is called hunger. And that hunger does not serve us anymore. In fact, it doesn't, it, it's the opposite of serving us. The hunger that we experience now motivates us to go eat these things, these highly processed, ultra processed food products that they say, I bet you can't eat just one, which is true. These are manipulated food products, combinations that never occur in nature of salt, of fat, of sugar and simple carbohydrates that just are feeding that primitive urge. And so now that you understand that, that process, the fact that hunger is a cue that no longer serves us well, you can use that to your advantage. I'm going to, I'm going to go back for just a moment. Um, to the conversation about squats, right? I just encouraged all of you to do a bunch of squats just for what it's worth. I've, I did 50 of them today, 50 deep squats today. That's my exercise for the day. It was really kind of bad weather. I'm going to probably get out hopefully uh, for a walk outside with my dog later. Um, but for the morning to get that caloric burn to get those muscles going, I did 50 squats, which is quite a lot of squats. I do them. Uh, I do them regularly. I would encourage you to do one or five or 10 if you have it in you. And when you do that, you're going to experience something. 
and that something you're going to experience probably that day or the next day. And that is that your muscles are going to be sore, right? And that soreness is uncomfortable, right? It, 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 we don't like it. It's, it's not a good feeling, kind of like hunger, right? It's not a good feeling. But when you do the squats, like I just suggested, and then tomorrow, when you feel the, that that kind of burn, that soreness in your quads, your hamstrings, or your or your glute muscles, you're gonna you're gonna think, wow, I don't. That's uncomfortable. I don't like that feeling, but I know that it's a good thing. It's actually a good thing because that means that that workout that I did yesterday was productive. It means that my muscles are growing and they're going to enhance in their strength and their ability to burn calories for me in the, in the future, right? So we welcome muscle soreness after exercise as a signal, as a sign, even if it's uncomfortable, that we made progress, right? So you know when you do a good workout, quads, squats, whatever, whatever the case may be, and then you're sore, you're like, ooh, that kind of hurts and I don't really like that. But I know that it's a sign that I did something good yesterday, right? So we welcome it. I mean, that's, it's, it's okay. Here's what I encourage you to do. I encourage you to feel the same way about hunger. Hunger is a cue. It's uncomfortable. I get it. No one likes being hungry. But you are not going to die in the way that your ancestors were if you don't eat. Um, if skip one meal. There's plenty of calories. You're being tricked by your own emotional and, and biological physiology, right? You're being cued to eat because your ancestors didn't have anything to eat. You have more than enough to eat. So if you have weight loss goals, hunger is your friend. Hunger is a sign, just like muscle soreness, that you're doing the right thing. Don't worry about it. You're not going to die. It's just an emotional cue that's a carryover from our evolutionary past, and it doesn't serve us well anymore. So that's the story about the relationship with hunger. I see that we are right around uh, around 15 minutes left to go. I'm going to just go real quick through the bullet points so you know what's coming and the notes that you're going to get. Um, the next bullet point after the hunger one is about, about doing this with a partner. And we can talk more about partnering up and how groups can be really, really effective for helping people motivate, find a friend, use someone in your family, use an online group. And again, we can talk more about that uh, coming soon. Pay attention to the little things, the little sprinkles and the splashes, that splash of cream in the coffee, that, that pat of butter on the pan or oil uh, on the pan that you're cooking. Those little sprinkles and splashes, they really add up. How much cheese did you sprinkle on that quesadilla that you made? Um, and you can cut that back dramatically. It's amazing how quickly those calories add up. Um, you're going to learn about sleep some more. You're going to learn about how to properly balance your blood sugar. Um, you're going to learn one of my favorite tricks is to, uh, is to close the kitchen. What we, what we a lot of times do knowing that late night hunger is a, is a, is a common phenomenon and you know, you don't really need to eat, brush your teeth early, right? Go upstairs, go to your bathroom, brush those teeth early, close the kitchen. Right. Um, and when you do that, that's sort of like a, you know, a, you, you have a cue inside of your mouth. You kind of like already got into your PJs. Uh, meal time is over. Little tricks like that can be really useful. Um, and then, of course, before we get to our questions, um, just be kind to yourself, right? This is a challenging thing. Um, we know that body, body positivity is so important. Avoiding that negative, negative sort of self talk and celebrating the small wins, celebrating the small successes is the key to long term and sustainable weight management. So, with that, I have my team uh, who is going to send me some of your questions. So forgive me, I'm going to pull out this uh, this uh, phone here so I can see some of the questions coming in. Um, and feel free, uh, as, as I'm answering these questions, to put your questions into the chat box. That's, uh, that's the best place for them, and then they will come to me. And in the next uh, 15 minutes or so, I'll do my best to answer them. So I'm going to look down and see what some of these are. The, um, the first question is a really good one, um, and that question is about the blood type diet. What do I think about the blood type diet? Um, the blood type diet, first of all, is it was written by a friend and a, and a colleague. His name is Peter Diadamo. He's a naturopathic doctor, just like me. Uh, in fact, he lives right, right down the road from here in Connecticut. Um, he is uh, brilliant. He, his, his father was also brilliant, who they, and they came up with this concept many, many, many years ago. Uh, there's a lot of really intriguing science behind the blood type and its influence on all kinds of uh, parameters, including including that on weight. Um, it's difficult to say. There's not a there, there's there's really no sufficient clinical data. There's no large scale data that shows that people that follow the blood type diet do better. Uh, you know, with weight loss or anything else um, than, than other placebo type of diets. 
What I do have to say uh, about Peter, and this isn't a criticism of the plan, is that if you look at the blood type diets that are available, you know, you have three blood types, A, B, and O. It's more complex than that, but for our purposes, A, B, and O. And there's different meal plans. You know, A's are allowed to eat X, Y, and Z, and B's are allowed to eat, you know, LMNOP. You get the idea. And uh, people love this because it's very specific, right? Um, and so if you look, though, at the diet, the foods that are available to all blood types, right? To any blood type, no matter what it is, A, B, or O, you will not see, let me tell you what you will not see. You will not see Snickers and Twinkies and Dunkin' Donuts and McDonald's and highly processed, ultra processed foods. The blood type diet is a diet, no matter which one you eat, of minimally processed whole foods primarily, exactly what I said before. Whether or not that's why it works, you know, oh, I'm eating blood type A and therefore I'm not eating Pepsi and so Soda. Nobody's allowed to eat soda. Nobody's allowed to, you know, uh, eat all those ultra processed foods on the blood type diet. So that may be part of it is that people are in a construct that is um, by definition related to their blood type, but also making positive dietary changes that are unrelated to their blood type. Uh, and then, and I, I, I got to give credit where credit is due, there is some really, really interesting biochemical nuance here um, that is related to immunology uh, that, that, that Peter's uh, elaborates inside of that book. So I think the blood type diet is a good thing. Any diet that helps people stick to a minimally processed whole foods diet um, to reduce inflammation, decrease their weight and improve their longevity is good by me. So that's, uh, that's the answer to that one. Um, Let's see. Uh, the, the second question is a really good one. I don't, I'm not sure who this came from, but it's a great question. I thank you for asking it. And it's that someone's d d been doing a workout and, and has lost uh, 22 pounds, but so far it feels like I can't lose any more and I'm in a plateau, right? So that plateau is a very, very common problem that people experience. Here's what you have to understand um, about these, these kind of weight loss plateaus. And that is that when you're losing weight, it means that you are in a caloric deficit, right? You are eating less calories than you are burning, right? And there's several ways to get there, eating less calories, burning more calories, having those bigger engines of those muscles on your frame to help burn those calories for you. But you lost 20 something pounds. Congratulations. The way you did that is by, for whatever period of time you were in there, you were burning more calories than you were consuming. And that is what facilitated the weight loss. At this point, you're on a plateau, right? And that plateau means you're flat. That And what that means, and it's a lock tight, 100%, you know, assurance. Right now, during your plateau phase, let's say you've been plateaued for two weeks. That means that during those two weeks, you have eaten the same amount of calories that you've burned. That's the only way to do that. That's the only way to be steady. Again, the beauties of human physiology. If your weight is stable for the last two weeks, then in those two weeks, you've eaten the exact same amount of calories that you've burned. So at this point, during that plateau to kind of break through it, something has got to shift. And what I would recommend is a short-term, more aggressive uh, approach to kind of break through that new plateau, uh, you know, adjust your physiology. And heavy weight, training with heavy weight, like I mentioned with squats, doing it with body weight, or if you already do squats, add a little bit of extra weight to those squats to bulk up the amount of muscle in your lower extremity is one way is one way to do that. Another way to do that on the, on the, on the input side, on the caloric side is to consider using some sort of fasting type of program like intermittent fasting, which I'm a big, big fan of. Um, we, we know there's metabolic increases that happen if a person goes, if take a 24 hour period and only eat during eight of those hours and don't eat during 16 of them. Uh, a 16, eight intermittent fast is a, a lot of times a way for someone to break through that plateau and kind of continue on the way down if you have uh, more weight to lose. So hopefully that answers your question. Um, Here's, here's one, and this is a, 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 a unfortunately common story um, from someone named Jackie who lost 70 pounds. Congratulations on that. And then gained it back since COVID-19. Um, yeah, the, the quarantine 15, in your case, Jackie, more than, more than that. Um, a, a terribly common story. Um, yes, we are in the middle of 
oh gosh, I mean, it's just so challenging for so many people. My heart goes out to the people who are just so, so suffering, both from this illness and from the social, financial uh, kind of consequences of this of this pandemic. It's just um, uh, unprecedented time in human history. Uh, it's very, very stressful for us all. So yeah, a lot of us have changed our behaviors. We have not gotten out to gyms, for example, or uh, doing other kinds of, you know, um, physical activity because we're kind of locked down in our houses. So that's part A. My solution there is just go outside, right? Um, no matter the weather, it doesn't matter what the weather is, have a rain jacket, have some snowshoes, which uh, some, some of you saw me and my wife doing on Instagram the last couple of days. Um, there's no such thing as bad weather, just inappropriate clothing, get outside and move your body for 20 minutes a day, do those squats, you know, kind of break through, um, you know, the, the other part is that we are under the influence of all this stress, right? And stress elevates our cortisol levels and cortisol gives our body this metabolic signal to, um, to, to store fat. So in, in that regard, yes, stress management techniques, there's, it's difficult to reduce our stress, although it seems like you know numbers in the United States are going down. Hopefully, uh, all, every all those pieces come together and we see an end to this madness soon, and hopefully a, a corresponding end to the stresses that's caused aberrant eating behavior, excessive caloric consumption, decreases in physical activity. You are not alone there, Jackie. All the same things that you hopefully did for your weight loss previously and the things we talked about today are part of the solution to the uh, to the post-quarantine, post-COVID uh, weight loss that so many people are going to need to do. Um, yeah, so uh, Jennifer asked a great question. I, I, I mentioned squats and I didn't mention this very important caveat. A lot of people can't do them. Uh, a lot of people can't do squats because they, uh, they have problems with their knees or problems with their hips or problems with their glutes, right? So it, in, in that case, a person is probably uh, in the care of an orthopedist or in the care of a physical therapist. I don't have time to get into the nuanced details here. There are absolutely ways to exercise your quadriceps, your hamstrings, and your glutes without putting uh, extra uh, strain on the hips, the knees, uh, or whatever joints that are bothering you. Um, my recommendation, assuming that you have physical therapy, is to is, is to look for ways to strength train, to, to, to do more aggressive um, strength-based training on, on those muscles without impacting those joints. There's absolutely ways to do that. A good physical therapist can give you guidance in that regard. Um, Another question about the squats. Yeah, wall squats are absolutely okay. Most of us, even those of us with bad knees, uh, and this is to, to both of those questions, Jennifer and Susan, are, are, are able to rise from a chair. Um, not everybody can rise from a chair. And so if, if you have trouble in the orthopedic department, spine, hips, knees, um, and, you, and this idea of squat sounds like a younger person's game or someone who has less pain than you do, I would challenge you to just get up out of a chair and, and do that and then do it again, and then do it again, and then do it again. Most of us are able to get out of a chair. Some of us need to use our upper body strength. Well, that's fine. Go ahead and use your upper body strength to do it too. Push using your muscles, your body weight up out of a chair, just like you do probably multiple times a day, and just do it repeatedly. There's your squats. Many of you won't be able to drop down like a toddler, you know, all the way down to the ground like that and then pop back up. If you can, fantastic. If you can't modify with a chair underneath you or using your upper body weight to, 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 to get your body weight up. So those are, those are great questions. I hope that's helpful. Um, let me see what our next one is. Charlie, what, uh, what is the best thing to use to decrease arthritis in our bodies. Arthritis is uh, such a such a common problem. Um, and we are going to do um, a, a, a more extensive YouTube live conversation on just that topic, joint pain, degenerative joint disease. Um, I think there's so much to say on that subject. The first all the things that we talked about today, right, which is eating a whole foods, minimally processed, anti-inflammatory type of diet are really, really foundational, as is physical activity. Um, and then, you know, beyond that, we can get all into the details of the specifics, nutrients and herbal medicines, many of them included in uh, Up Wellness's formula, Golden Revive Plus, which is something that you might want to look at, um, because th that's where I go beyond uh, diet and lifestyle with respect uh, to joint pain. Um, Dallas asked a question, which is a great one. And, and the question is, can medication affect weight loss? And the answer is yes. And the answer is yes in both directions. Um, medication can absolutely affect metabolic rate. Um, and some medications 
are medications that increase metabolic rate. So that's, for example, uh, thyroid hormone, one of the most commonly prescribed drugs, will have an influence on metabolic rate. People should not take thyroid hormone unless they need it, but when they do, they often lose weight because the sluggish thyroid decreases the metabolic rate. Fixing that or, or solving that problem with medication for thyroid hormone uh, can increase the metabolic rate and help people lose weight. So that's an example of uh, just one example. Any kind of amphetamine stimulant type of thing will also uh, increase the metabolic rate and, and, and help facilitate weight loss. Using medications, by the way, for weight loss, conventional prescription medications, generally speaking throughout history has been a terrible idea and is almost always associated uh, with adverse effects that are worse uh, than uh, you know than most people are willing to tolerate. So medications can yes affect the metabolic rate, and then a whole bunch of medications can affect appetite and also affect metabolic rate in the opposite direction. So common classes of drugs like antidepressants, the SSRIs, are well known um, for increasing people's. Uh, in, in, increasing people's weight. That's one of the main reasons why many people on those sorts of antidepressants want to get off of them is because they have trouble losing weight or they gain a lot. Um, steroid hormones, which like prednisone, for example, a lot of people use for inflammatory conditions, um, notorious for causing weight gain and a big round puffy face is one of the side effects. Um, so yeah, absolutely. Different medications can have an impact on weight. And as I say, as a naturopathic doctor, listen, ask your doctor, if you're on a medication that is not working or causing some kind of adverse effects, very often there are alternatives, alternative medications and other alternatives to those medications that can help you. So um, so certainly, you know, don't be on medications, but talk to your doctor before discontinuing anything if they're making it more difficult for you to lose weight. It's worthy of a conversation uh, with, with, with your doctor. Uh, I just looked over on the chat and I saw David saying, I really enjoy your outlook and suggestions. And I thank you for that, David. It's good to know that we're, we're getting through. I hope this information can help you. Um, Julia, I'm addicted to chocolate. <laughs> uh, Julia, that's a, there's worse addictions, right? Um, the, you know, what can I do? The more I eat, the more I eat, right? Um, chocolate's good for you, especially dark chocolate. So Julia, here's the, here's the solution. I'm, I'm a big fan of chocolate myself. Um, I do it in a guilt-free way. What I do is I get good quality chocolate, um, 70 percent or above dark chocolate um, and usually what I'll do is I'll bring home that bar and I will break it into serving sizes quite literally um, I'll break it up into component pieces and then I just basically set limits around myself um, it, it, it's it's I know that this is a challenging thing to do but humans and I'm going to leave you with this because I think it's an important point that I didn't make earlier Julia thank you for your chocolate question I'm going to talk to you my practice and also a practice that I think can be useful to you um, when we think about raising children or uh, caring for animals, um, what you can't see off screen right now is my dog, Rhea, is just sitting right over here. She's a well-trained dog. She has good behavior. She knows her limits. When you're training a dog or when you're raising a child, of which I have three, does anybody out there think that it's a good idea to just like cut them loose, give them no limits, no boundaries, eat as much as you want, run wherever you want, behave however you want, go on your computer or your phone or your video games as much as you want. Humans and animals function better within limits. You've heard before, good fences make good neighbors, right? It's absolutely true. We need limits. Limits are good for us. We can explore. We can become enlightened. We can um, find our true selves. We can find the answers to the questions within those limits. Boundaries are good. Yes, children and animals will resist the boundaries. We like to go up and explore the edge of the fence, but boundaries are useful for humans and for animals. And so one way to practice that boundaries to your question, Julia, about chocolate is to set a limit right? You, there's a serving size on the back of that chocolate bar. It might be two or three squares, depending on the square. Break off those two or three squares, set them aside, go to the cabinet at, You know when you're going to have your chocolate because a, a small dose of daily dark chocolate, 70% above, perfectly healthy to do. Eat those two or three squares and that's it. That's the limit, right? That's your limit for today. You can have more tomorrow. That's an example of putting kind of lane lines, putting boundaries around your own behavior in a really, really excellent way in many ways of your life, not just chocolate, to kind of put those parameters, those lanes, um, traffic signs, if you will, lane lines around your behavior. So I hope that's, uh, that's helpful to you. Um, let's see. 
All right. I think we, oh, well, I'm looking at a clock here. Yo, we want, even went over time. This was a fun discussion. I hope that you all enjoyed it as much as I did. Um, here I am in my house. And it's such a treat to be able to talk to about a hundred of you today. Um, I hope that the information, the stories that we told were inspiring, um, were motivating to you in some way. And then I hope that you can take those action steps and the tips of which there are 20 uh, in uh, the, the notes that are going to get delivered to you shortly and make them part of who you are. It is such a pleasure to have you with us here today. Um, it is, uh, I'm really enjoying this um, and uh, I look forward to seeing you all soon. I'm going to be off uh, next week. So we will return with another one of these YouTube live streams. Uh, uh, hot topic live streams uh, two weeks from now. Um, and I will really look forward to seeing all of you and many more um, at that point. Take good care, everybody. It is a pleasure uh, to see you here. Bye-bye.